Jesus sends out other people? That's what we're going to talk about today in Luke 10. All right. So we've been talking about the ministry of Jesus, and we've started our long march towards Jerusalem. We sent people out to Samaria to tell them that Jesus is coming. Prepare the way. Some towns rejected him, and some towns, I guess, did not. But now, Jesus says that he appointed 72 others and sent them ahead of him, two by two. I think it's better to go with other people. You don't know what you're going to face to everywhere that they're going to go coming up soon. He says to them, and we've seen this in other Gospels, quote, in ESV, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Now, we thought, you know, we're thinking the apostles. We're thinking about us, too, right? We're the laborers. We're supposed to be doing these things. But he's calling more people out, telling them that they're going to do things, too. He tells them that they should pray because the Lord of Harvest is sending the laborers out to the field. And being agricultural people, we totally get this phrase. But he says that they're going to be lambs in the midst of wolves. Again, don't carry anything with you. Don't take anything with you. And then, like, this is so urgent. You're not even supposed to talk to people on the road. I think, again, because those itinerant rabbis who were really just fundraising for themselves would talk to everyone they could on the road. But just get going. Talk to them. And when you enter a town and you enter a home, peace be to your house. And if there is, it says, a son of peace in the house, your peace will rest on them. And stay in that house and eat and drink whatever they provide you. It says the laborer deserves his wage. But don't go house to house. Just stay there. Stay in the one place. Tell them that the kingdom of God come near you. We are telling you this is about to happen. If they don't receive you, just like the towns, just like we talked about before, dust the town from, you know, the mere dust. I don't even want that dust on me because this town rejected me. And go and move on. And he says that if these towns that reject you, it will be more bearable in that day for Sodom than those towns. And we know Sodom was punished by God in a very dramatic way of fire and brimstone. So those 72 bring us to the idea of the Sanhedrin, which were 72 people. But this is his new leadership. You kind of see now that Jesus has called 12 people to be his apostles, representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Now we have 72 others. These are going to be people, I imagine, who stood out strong in the group of people that were following him. He has this order that's going on, and he's reconstructing it. And also think again that none of these people necessarily, none of the apostles, were professional ministers. Everybody's job is to tell the gospel, to minister to people, to bring the message of God, and in the case of the apostles, the healing and the casting of demons. This is not something that is just for pastors to do. People, I think, think that. I don't have to tell the gospel of Jesus. That's what my pastor does. That's why we pay our stipend so that my pastor can go tell people about Jesus. I don't have to. This is about everybody. And you see, even in the stories, we have Mark, who is not an apostle, telling the story of probably Peter. We have Luke, who's a doctor, telling everybody's story, interviewing people, telling and hearing the story of the women who follow Jesus. These are people from all corners of life, meant to be ambassadors, meant to be messengers of God. I think that's a good image of what we are too. I met a guy when I was working at InterVarsity and he told me that. He was telling me that everybody in the Bible had jobs, other jobs. And he did the Word and Life Bible collection because he wanted people to know that these were workers. These were people with jobs that had such an impact on me. I mean, you can see today, it still does. I think about the farmers and the fishermen and the regular people Jesus brings into the Bible. I think in the other Gospels, this part of the story feels random. Like suddenly he starts talking about Sodom and Gomorrah and then Tyre and Sidon, and you think it's out of the blue. But really, it's in context of the fact that he's about to send these 72 other people ahead of him. He knows that their path is going to be rough. It's not going to be easy. There are places that are going to accept them and places that are not going to accept them. And he tells them what to do. But then he goes on to the woes that local cities like Bethsaida and says, you know, all the things I did for you in your town, if they had been done in Tyre and Sidon, which was a land of Asher, 
but now is the land of Canaanites, Phoenicians, they would have repented. They'd be sitting in sackcloth and ashes, you know, like repentant John the Baptist who wore clothes and no means and be humbled, sackcloth and ashes was like Jeremiah weeping for the nation's sins. They'd be like that. It'd be unbearable for them because they would feel the judgment. Or for Capernaum, where I spent all my time. I hung out in Capernaum. I did all my things. And you will be brought down to Hades because you saw all these things. You had front row seats to my ministry and you ignored me. You ignored the message of God. You who have ears here, you aren't hearing. You weren't listening. You rejected me. And those who reject me reject the one who sent me, which is God himself, God the Father, the one you say you worship. So he is giving some pretty dim messages about them. But he's sending these 72 out because they have to hear the words too. But you know what? The 72 came back. Not one of them ended up dead, but they came back rejoiceful. The demons even subjected to your name. You know, they they thought this was amazing stuff. And this is a really interesting thing he says at this point. He says in ESV, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you the authority to tread on serpents and scorpions over all the powers of the enemy. Nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subjected to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. They did God's work. Don't be amazed by the things of this world and fighting evil. That's neither here nor there. It's great, you know, I think. But your part is the fact that your names will be written in heaven. Ooh, that's kind of interesting. I mean, every year when you're Jewish, you pray at the time of the Jewish New Year that your name will be written in the book of life one more year. This is being written in heaven, which means not just here, not just life now but eternity. You want that. And then he rejoiced, it says, in the Holy Spirit. Jesus even thanks his Father, the Lord of heaven and earth. You have hidden, you know, things from wise people. All these smart and studied people, they're sitting there trying to trap Jesus. They don't really get what God's message is about. How many of you ever see that? Where you'll be, I remember being in a sociology class and it was talking about, well, we think if we do X, Y, and Z, We'll cure all the problems of the world. And I thought, have you met people? That's never going to work in a million years. People are not going to accept this theory you have. They're wise. They're studied. They don't live among real people. They don't understand real people. That's why there's always the phrase about people who live in the ivory towers. They don't understand what's going on in the real world. I was listening to a professor I was working with, in fact. And she was talking about, you know, people in general and how we weren't finding some of the findings that she expected to see. And I I said at one point, I think it's a different age. This test that we're giving them is from the 50s. We have different attitudes now. We're a different kind of people. We have different problems, but we've had some successes on some of these issues. And so I don't suspect anyone would answer to any of these types of questions. She looks at me and she kind of said, really? You don't, you don't think we're different people than we were in the 50s? You know, for good or bad, of course we are. You know, she was a leading researcher in psychology and human nature and didn't understand the most basic human behavior. What was going out in the world today? That's the ivory tower. And I think, at least in my mind, this is what I was thinking. You know, all these people are wise and they're smart and they're studied. They're missing the whole point. They don't know what's going on. But Jesus here is thanking God for revealing things to children, to maybe you people you would consider the unwise. They get it. They see it. But these smart people, these people who are educated, who study what they think is the scripture, they're off track. And all things have been handed over to me by my Father. So everything is Jesus. That no one knows the Son except the Father. He knows who I really am. Or who the Father is. You don't even know who the Father is, except the Son, me, Jesus is saying, chooses to reveal to him. You're not seeing who the real Father of God is. You you think you know what he wants. You think you know what he's after. 
you think you are following his words that were given to you, time of Noah, the time of Abraham, and the time of Moses and Elijah, you've missed it. And I'm here to reveal it to you. And even the most simple people are getting it. Then he says, quote, blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many prophets and kings desired to see what you see, but didn't see it. And to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Wouldn't David love to be sitting here today? Wouldn't Elijah love to be sitting here in his ministry or Jeremiah? Wouldn't all these people do it? And yet these 12 and his disciples, the other 72 and the other people that were following him, because he's saying this to his disciples, which is the larger group of believers, you've, you're witnessing something amazing here. And that's where I think he's tying it in. All these corrupted cities of Tyre and Sidon and Sodom and Gomorrah, if they had seen any of this, they would have repented. Yet how many places have we gone and been rejected? He gives the parable, which is one of the most famous parables of the New Testament called the Good Samaritan. And so a lawyer came and it said it was putting him to a test, right? So again, they're trying to trap Jesus in this whole bit. And so he says, well, teacher, what should I do? He says to inherit eternal life. And so he says, well, you know, how do you read it? How do you read what the law of God is? And the lawyer summarizes it like Jesus summarizes it. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. That is exactly what Jesus said too. And Jesus says, you've answered correctly. Do this and you'll live. Okay, so there's more. So he he, he summarized the whole law in that one sentence. So he gives a parable. And we all, if you've read the Bible before, you've heard this parable. So guy was walking from Jerusalem to Jericho. I did the hike with uh, my friend. When I was in Israel, it's beautiful, and robbers, you know, beat him up, took all his stuff and left him for dead. And so then this is a very busy road. It was a busy road when I was there. But so people are walking back and forth and a priest is walking by the road and he sees him and he goes to the other side of the road. I don't want anything to do with that. A Levite who's going to be like the son of Aaron, you know, the, the official family that was given the priesthood comes by, sees him. And also goes to the other side of the road. Two people who you would go to for help. You know, just like if I were in trouble and I saw a man with a cloth around his neck as a priest or a pastor. I mean, that's where I would go for help, right? I'm going to go walk on the other side of the street. Samaritan, who is at odds with Jewish people. They don't like each other. Walking down this road too, sees the man, has compassion, heals him, puts oil and gives him wine puts him on his own animal, like his donkey, takes him to the next town, puts him at an inn, pays for the entire inn, two days wages, and says, please take care of this man until I come back. And Jesus says, you know, which of these three people did the will of God? And of course, the man said, of course, the man who showed him mercy, that's the man who's doing God's will. Jesus says, you know what? You go do that too. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And One of the commentaries I was looking at was talking about how easy it is for us to come up with excuses about why we wouldn't do it. I don't know who that man is. What if he got beat up because he's a bad person? Or I got, I have places to go. I have to be, you know, on the way to Jerusalem on time. I don't have time to do what it's going to take to help this man. All the excuses in the world why we don't help each other why we're not a brother to each other, why we don't give mercy and love to each other. And in the end, the one person you didn't expect, the one man who was treated, you know, people said the Samaritans were treated like half-breeds, not even heirs of God. You know, some of them were people who remained in Israel while they were under Babylonian captivity. Some of them had children and families with the people who were not Jewish, some of them did. Some of them were people that the Babylonians brought in, Syrians too, brought in and repopulated the area. They didn't want national sympathy, you know? So then those two sacking nations brought people in and said, well, you go live there now, you know, because they're going to be less trouble than the people who were indigenous to the area because they had no connection to the land. 
So they were treated that way. They were unloved people, yet their belief system is very similar to Judaism. They are now Jewish. They are now Jewish and Israeli citizens when you see Samaritans in Israel. And yet they were treated so poorly. But this man did everything he could do. He paid and cared for this man. And that is what we're expected to do. I think God, too, is putting up this interesting point that you reject everybody. You reject me. You reject John the Baptist. You don't like the tax collectors. You don't like the woman who was possessed by demons. You didn't help her. You didn't help the poor. You treat everyone poorly. If there's a widow who needs your help, you help her by taking her land from her. You're not helping anyone. Yet even the lowliest people can help and do the will of God. But you're not. You're not doing these things. But this man, he recognized it. And Jesus recognized him for being on target. I remember a long time ago, I saw a motorcycle slide off the road and I was driving. It was on a highway and I'm you know, going 60 miles an hour. And so I called the police and I said, just to let you know, there was a guy at the corner of County Trunk of this and this highway and he fell off his bike. And I think he's OK because I saw him walking around. But maybe you want to go check on him. And the person on the 911 line said, well, why didn't you stop? Why didn't you go and check on him yourself? Oh, so we turned back and I felt horrible. And he was gone at that point. We don't think about it, you know, and that is what it means to be a brother or sister to someone is to go and care for them. Now we have the story of Martha and Mary. Everybody loves the story. In fact, I'm doing a book about Martha and Mary in Start With Small Steps podcast coming up in a probably next week, I think. And so he goes into the town because, like I said, we're on the crawl towards Jerusalem. He goes into the village and a woman named Martha is at her house and she has a sister called Mary. And secret, Martha and Mary's brother is Lazarus. So this is a wealthy family, but we have heard from this family before. It was Mary who sat at the feet of Jesus listening to him teach. Martha, she's cooking up a meal. She's getting ready for serving other people. She's making sure the house is in proper order. And she comes up to Jesus and says, you know what? My sister is not helping me. I'm doing all these things, trying to get ready for you, trying to make a meal. And instead, she's just sitting there listening to you. And Jesus says, Martha, Martha, doesn't it sound exasperated? You are so anxious and troubled about so many things. You worry about a lot. But there is one thing that is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion. She's taken the good half of the pie, which is not going to get taken away from her. She's doing the right thing. And this book is talking about how we live in a world filled with Marthas, you know, trying to get things done and trying to do everything that's right and trying to, and, and of course we want to, we want our families to be fed. We want our husbands to be happy. And yet how many times do we sit at the feet of Jesus and listen? That is the idea behind this book. And that's what we're going to talk about. But Jesus is right. I think so many people feel like Martha's when they should be thinking about Mary's and listening to Jesus while he's here on this planet. He talks about this. This is like the wedding and the bridegroom is here. He is not going to be with us for very long. And think about what a shame it would be not to sit at the feet and listen to Jesus when he's not going to be here for much longer. So what I'm going to meditate this week is about how we can get busy. We can get off track about spending time with God, reading the scripture, learning more about what Jesus wants from us, what the Bible tells us, because we're busy. We're too busy. We don't make that time. And then we wonder why our relationship with God is so distant, why we don't feel the things we feel, or we don't know the things that we should know. You know, that if you say something and then it's like, I, I don't know what the answer to that is. Why don't, why don't we know the answer to these things? Isn't the Bible and the scripture the most important thing to us? But we live in a world of Martha's trying to get things done when we should be a little bit more like Mary. And what I'm going to pray about is for God to give me that time of being Mary, where I can sit at the feet of Jesus and listen to him. Now you may say, Chill, you have two podcasts about the Bible. 
and Christian living. You are spending a lot of time listening to Jesus. And you're absolutely right. This Bible study has been a big event for me. It's been great for me. But I'm also doing it and taking notes and writing up things and reading a bunch of commentaries about it, which is good for me for learning. But how much time am I spending deep diving, letting it seep into my soul? I I need to do a little bit better job of making sure that I'm also doing it for my own personal worship, I guess, and learning. And what I'm going to share with others is this concept that Jesus sends out all of us to be messengers, to be harvesters of his word. We shouldn't be fancy about it. I don't think it requires us to have PhDs in anything. It doesn't require us to be paid members of the church, staff of the church, to invite people to talk about the kingdom of God, to talk about the Messiah. These are people who are just everyday people who had everyday lives, and yet Jesus called them to talk and prepare the way for him. We could do the same thing too, and I want everyone to know that. All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate listening to the podcast. Please remember to pray for me, and I'll pray for you too. And hope that this word, just like it is for me, is sinking in, that it's helping you, it's helping you in your studies or encouraging you in your studies. I pray for me that I get things right, and I know I must be making mistakes too. So please pray for me in that, and I pray for you as well. And if you have private prayers or petitions, You can send them to jill at smallstepswithgod.com. You can use a private email. Just tell me what you want me to pray for you about. I'm happy to do it. Thank you so much.